these, Rowdy. You thought that was as ridiculous as it could get? Ugh, if only you were here right now. Okay, I'm taking no chances after Con Bravo. Is this my room? Life is good sometimes. Ah, oh, yeah, my old review of Super K. <laughs> yeah, the 80s had some really dumb cartoons based off of video games. Man, I dealt with some bad ones in 10 years of reviewing bad TV shows. And you know what? Sometimes I think I still haven't scraped the bottom of the barrel. Why? I just backed myself into a crossover review, didn't I? Why did I think finally coming to these cons was a good idea? What would you get if you took a bad video game cartoon from the 1980s, but instead put it in the 1990s? You get my nightmares for the next three weeks? Yeah, remember long ago when I said Nintendo backed off from making cartoons about their games after the Super Mario World cartoon bombed? Turns out that wasn't exactly correct. First, some backstory. In the mid-90s, Nintendo gave their flagship character's first ever nemesis a much-needed makeover and face turn with the release of the Donkey Kong Country video game for the Super NES, which was all about the titular stupid ape and his little buddy Diddy Kong looking to reclaim his fabled banana horde from a kingdom of evil crocodiles called the Kremlings. To be honest, the platformer still holds up pretty good today. It really pushed the boundaries for what a 16-bit game could do graphically, and it ranks right up there with the Super Mario games of the time for having plenty of hidden puzzles and secret levels that make replaying the game never dull. The success of the game led to two sequels on the Super Nintendo, and they all had Game Boy ports under the Donkey Kong Land title. However, prior to the release of the third game on Super Nintendo on November 1996, Novan Unlimited, with the aid of various studios, created a show for French audiences on September of that year. It later aired in Canada on October of 1997. Oh wait, this wasn't made for American audiences? Not my jurisdiction! Bye! It later aired in the U.S. on Fox Kids the following year. I catch worse breaks than the Rangers. Okay, so how bad does this thing get? Well, let's start with the fact that this is a show where you might not be able to know the true episode order if you never saw this show in its first run. Going by three different wiki sites, Wikipedia, the Donkey Kong Wiki, and the Mario Wiki, because of course if anything shows up in the Mario universe, it has to show up in their wiki, they list all 40 episodes in different orders. Even better, while Wikipedia and the DK Wiki show them being part of two seasons, the Mario Wiki lists them as three seasons. And I thought Turtlepedia was all screwed up with the first TMNT series. The most likely first episode may be the one stated as such by the Mario and DK Wikis and episode lists on YouTube, Bad Hair Day. As it opens with this huge exposition dump from Cranky Kong, who, for the record, is supposedly the original Donkey Kong from the arcade game and grandfather of the current title character, he goes on about how his grandkid is the protector and future king of the island of Congo Bongo. They... they named their homeland Congo Bongo. How do you take the concept of Congo Land from Captain N and make it even dumber? They took a lot of bong hits? I might have thought of that pun if my brain wasn't atrophying right now. Oh, it gets better. The show creators seem to think a war with crocodiles over bananas wasn't enough to carry an animated series. So here, the Kongs are the guardians of this magical MacGuffin called the Crystal Coconut, which King K. Roll is always looking to steal and give him enough power to rule all the land. Yep. They're ripping off the Legend of Zelda cartoon. And yes, K. Rule is pretty much Ganon in this series, as he himself has magical powers at his disposal, as the main plot of this episode is about him cursing DK to lose his strength when his hair gets cut. <laughs> 
So they're also ripping off an old episode of the ALF cartoon! How many 80's animated series are you looking to steal from? Good lord what is up with his head. That's still shaped in the form of his hair. Like, how do you even describe such a thing? And this isn't even scratching the surface with this series. Don't tell me that wasn't the worst episode. That wasn't the worst episode. I asked you not to tell me that. Well, during the second episode, in which Cranky makes a potion to make himself younger so he can beat King K. Rule, Donkey Kong ends up drinking the potion himself and he gets turned into a baby. A really ugly baby. And Diddy has to pretend that he's someone else in front of Candy Kong. You know what? How about you just read off how many stock plots this show is gonna rip off? Okay! Well, in what might have been the first episode, somewhere, Diddy turns himself invisible by wishing on the crystal coconut. Because that's how powerful the coconut is. There's an episode where DK gets amnesia and thinks he's a pirate. An episode where K. Rule makes a love potion to make DK and Candy his slaves. An episode where Diddy learns what their names mean. Chunky Kong's Chunky and Cranky Kong's Cranky. <laughs> well, did you tell Dixie? I did. <laughs> what did she say? Uh, something about driving the fence out of Chickamauga. <laughs> huh? Okay, I made that one up. But what I'm not making up is when they pretty much parodied It's a Wonderful Life. How did this show get passed over by Totally Spies for everyone's go-to fetish cartoon? Meanwhile, it also turns out that one tribe of crocodiles wasn't enough to carry the show. As there is also a group of croc pirates whose captain claims to have originally possessed the crystal and left it on Congo Bongo in the temple of the island god Inka Dinka Du, who eventually gave it to Donkey Kong upon declaring him the future ruler of Bongo. I think. All of this was mashed together in a direct-to-VHS movie that took clips from a handful of episodes and gave it the same title as the first season finale, The Legend of the Crystal Coconut. Yep! They're not only ripping off concepts from cartoons of the 80s, they're taking concepts from Galactica 1980! You could not fail harder if you tried! So, okay, let's talk about the animation. Yes, they're going with the same 3D CGI style that was used in the game, which sounds like a good idea on paper, but really makes you wonder what they were thinking when you see it in real life. It worked in the game because it was a huge step forward from the even more pixelated graphics of most console video games we were used to seeing back then. But when applying it to TV animation... Look, you know I'm not some militant 2D animation purist, but if you're going with 3D animation, you gotta go with the high quality stuff that a major movie would normally use. Or else, yeah, Uncanny Valley territory. And I would use the excuse that this was one of the first times it was used for TV, except things haven't gotten that much better since. The characters have this habit of constantly moving about, usually in place, and a lot of it might be caused by them using motion capture for most of their movement. It was considered to be the first full-length animated show to use motion capture technology, and it shows given how some of the models clip into themselves. Crusha is a good example of this, as his arm joints seem to be merged into his torso. And at least I forget, Donkey Kong's teeth! I swear, he seems to be like Toothless the Dragon where he just has gums, but then his teeth can come out whenever he's angry or something. Surprisingly, this is something that carries over into some other games he's in. But here, it's especially uncanny given the animation. As for those characters, most of them were in the game. DK, his buddy Diddy, Cranky, their friend Funky, and DK's crush Candy. But Candy seems to be the one who got the most change, as she goes from dressing like Daisy May to Daisy Duke. And as for her personality, let's just say they found a way to make DK and Candy's relationship more annoying than Link and Zelda from that cartoon. I brought you these. Ooh, I was gonna get you a cake. But I see you already got one. Donkey Kong? Every 
every single time you show up, things just fall apart. Whose banana peel is that? What banana peel? The one that was left on the ground. The one that I slipped on. The one on your head, you baboon! But we also have one, maybe two new guns. The first is Eddie, the mean old Yeti, who is usually causing trouble whenever he shows up. I mean, he is mean after all, but is otherwise not that big of a threat. Though whether or not you consider him a Kong is something we have to leave up to the wiki. The more prominent new character we have, though, is Bluster Kong. He's the owner of a barrel factory that Candy works for and is constantly trying to hit on her. So he's basically Mr. Spacely from the Jetsons mixed with Leisure Suit Larry and then made into an ape. Joy! Now for the Kremlings, only they aren't called that in the show. We have our main baddie, King K. Rule, who is pompous and very full of himself. We have his loyal but bumbling general, Clump, the dim-witted musclehead, Crusha, and they have a bunch of critters for their army. One of their main weapons is a gun that shoots out clap traps that are normal sized one minute, but they seem to disappear whenever they tear up wood, like they're freaking termites. So how do most of K. Rule's plans turn out? If you watched action cartoons from the 90s, you can probably guess. Oh, no. The eggs are fried! The eggs Perhaps Cranky's youth serum will give me back my fighting spirit. Where'd you go? Bobby! There's so much taken from cartoons like the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, it's not even funny. In addition to the standard bumbling villain and his even more bumbling lackeys, we of course have to get a really bad theme song that tries way too hard to be him. And how about a bad catchphrase for the main character? Banana slap! Nope, let's get Warty is still worse. <laughs> but really, there's only one thing that could truly make it special if they add in one or two songs in each episode. Oh, God, the songs. Many are pretty much original, and I admit, many aren't badly sung. And I especially love DK's voice a lot of the time. Don't you see? Water Nation is the key. It's my balance that takes hold of me. Take your arms, wave them in the air. Keep yourself from falling and you'll glide without a care. Eddie, let me go back to my home. Without me, everything's all wrong. Eddie, let me go back to my home. However, a lot of the time the songs can feel forced. Like they had to have a song play no matter what, even if it makes no sense to have one. Hell, some even come right the heck out of nowhere. Eddie, push the big red button. He can't! You can be here, you can be there, anywhere. You can go any place you wanna go, don't you know? You're just an image of yourself floating in the air. Can't lift a thing and you can't. I guess you could give the creators credit for trying to be original when Super Mario and Captain N only used covers of pop songs for background noise, but yeah, let's just say we aren't talking Phineas and Ferb territory with some of these numbers. Choreography in the songs also tends to have the same issues with the animation as it normally does with awkward movements that can be memed like crazy. Got a date with Candy. Oh, but at least we forget, during this one love song that DK and Candy have, we have this lovely treasure. I'd shower you with coconut cream pies. I knew it was coconut gun fired in spurts, but I didn't think this was what they meant. All of it was enough for the show to get 40 episodes total over two or three seasons. 
possibly because Fox Kids was just starting up and desperate for material. It did air on TV Tokyo for a bit, starting in 1999, but the show has more or less been thrown into obscurity ever since. And at least we never got to see any mention of this show in video game lore ever again. They used the Crystal Coconut for power-ups in DK64. WHERE WAS NINTENDO'S BRAIN AT THE TURN OF THE CENTURY?! This show was if someone binged on the video game cartoons of the 80s 10 years later and decided they knew they could make some that were even more pandering. The stories can vary, and they admittedly aren't much more basic than their predecessors, but it doesn't help at all that the animation is really creepy at times, and they too often just throw too much at you. It's not as bad as Battletoads, but it's beyond skippable. I can agree to most of that. They try so much to add variation to their stories, but they come off hammy, uncanny, and so on. And not helped by the bad animation. Yet, every so often, I do get a laugh out of the few lines or bits that stand out. There are some good jokes here and there, and the bad animation does kind of enhance it a bit. Maybe it's because I tend to find this stuff funnier in small doses, but I almost see this as a so-bad-it's-good kind of show. It's definitely not for everyone, and your mileage will vary. But if you're into this sort of stuff, you may find it humorous. Eh, well, I suppose there isn't any possible way they could have made it even worse. Hey, like to know, boo-boo, the king to rock and roll, Donkey Kong no, 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 Well, I'm the media hunter. I'm gonna get some banana pudding. What happened to King Garool? Ah! Uncle Swampy always says bye-bye.